Welcome and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and even good night for the bravest of you. And thank you for being here with us today. My name is Julia Sayeva. I am a Marie Curie Fellow at the Strathclyde Center for Environmental Law and Governance. And I am really honored to be opening this session of the 2020 virtual training series of the UN and NIPA Foundation Program Alumni Network, which is on gender mainstreaming in the ocean, promoting equality, including in the context of COVID-19 recovery. Today's sessions will focus on the importance of gender mainstreaming in ocean affairs, with a focus on ocean processes, key issues, current developments, and the peculiar threats that are being posed by COVID-19 pandemic to efforts to promote gender equality. This session is hosted and organized by the One Ocean Hub, which is an international collaboration of researchers in 22 institutions coming from UK, South Africa, Namibia, Ghana, South Pacific, and the Caribbean. Um, the Ocean Hub, um, it's funded by UK, the UK Research and Innovation through the Global Challenges Research Fund, and uh, really puts uh, uh, at the heart of, it really works at the, at the heart of efforts to tackle UN Sustainable Development Goals. The Hub is led by the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, UK. We're working together with 30 or more than 30 partners projects and including UN agencies, regional and international organizations, community representatives, NGOs and media organizations with the aim of transfor transforming our response to the urgent challenges faced by our ocean. In particular, the hub research seeks to, bre seeks to bridge current disconnections in law, science, society, and integrative governance frameworks to balance multiple ocean uses with conservation at different scales. So, well, the, the virtual format of today's seminar and of the whole series, it's maybe less pleasant and less social than a face-to-face one, but it is actually allowing the participation of over uh, 160 people coming from all over the world. And I think this is a really great achievement to be widely welcomed. For this reason, and to allow everyone to grasp the diversity of our participants, I invite you all, if you wish, to introduce yourself in the chat function of the platform. Instead, if and when you would like to pose a question or a comment for our panelists, please, it would be great if you could type them briefly in the Q&A function. Um, if the questions are addressed to specific panelists, please specify. I will then collect them for the panelists who will try to answer as many questions as possible during our Q&A session, which is at the end. Uh, and I already need to apologize for all those questions that for time reasons will not be answered, but we'll do our best. Uh, please be aware that we are recording the session and we will be making it available online for the benefits of those that were not able to attend it today. Um, well, before commencing, allow me to thank Valentina Germani and Jessica Howell, or Howley from the Division of Ocean Affairs of, and the Law of the Sea, and Elisa Murgera, Director of the One Ocean Hub, for their support in organizing uh, this seminar. Let me also thank uh, Rose Bowell of the Mandela University in South Africa, who contributed to the organization of this session, but unfortunately could not attend as one of the speakers today. Last but not least, let me thank Joe Pitt and Laura Morilainen from the University of Strathclyde for the technical support. So, as you know, to the topic of today's webinar is gender mainstreaming and ocean affairs, which is very much at the heart of One Ocean Hub approach to ocean affairs. The Hub, in fact, strives to empower women as well as communities and children to inform decisions based on multiple values and knowledge systems. Um, several studies have showed that public policies and other decision-making procedures are often based on the need of the no dominant groups and societies or of the needs of those that have traditionally been making decisions, um, which most of the times are men. Gender mainstreaming, which is the central topic of today's seminar, was first introduced in, at the 1985 Nairobi World Conference on Women and it really entails the reorganization, improvement and development of an evaluation of policies progress processes 
so that gender equality is actually incorporated into all pro policies at all levels, at all stages, and by all actors that are normally involved in policy making. Gender mainstreaming is grounded in the consideration of the difference between the conditions, situations, and needs of women and men. And it is a way to make women as well as men's concerns and experiences truly integral, of a truly integral dimension of the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of policies and programs in all political, economic, and societal spheres so that women and men can benefit equally. It is important to bear in mind, though, that gender mainstreaming has to be understood as a complementary strategy, not a substitute for targeted women-centered programs. Both gender mainstreaming and specific measures are needed. Such a dual approach is well shown by the UN Agenda for Sustainable Development which includes a standalone target, a, sorry, a standalone goal on gender equality and empowerment of women and girls, as well as many gender sensitive targets within the other goals. It is responsibility of all our actors to create gender mainstreaming. And also on policies areas, which at first uh, sight might not seem relevant, might actually contain hidden aspects of gender inequality and the specific relevance of gender mainstreaming for ocean affairs will be explored by our invited speakers, Dr. Maria Mala rodriguez Chavez, Lisa Willy, and Gina A. Odruro. Let me first give the floor to Dr. Maria Mala rodriguez Chavez, who is the Nippon Fellow Program and LUNI representative, so I'm sure that most of you know her, and has more than 10 years experience in working with environmental non-governmental organizations as, and as an independent consultant on diverse environmental topics. Currently, she is the consult, she's consultant for the High Seas Alliance and works closely with the Latin American countries participating in the UN negotiation processes on the conservation and sustainable use on, of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, Maria Maria, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julia. I will share my screen because I have a presentation for today's session. So let's see if that's working. Yeah there. So uh, first of all, thank you everyone for joining this morning, uh, afternoon and night session uh, for you all. Um, and also thank you for the organizers for the invitation to be part of this webinar. Um, before starting with the presentation that I will be doing today on gender mainstreaming in ocean governance bodies, I want to briefly refer to the United Nations and Nippon Foundation Fellowship Program, um, which is focused in capacity building opportunities uh, on ocean affairs and law of the sea for developing states. So once you finish the program, um, you become part of an alumni network. And I am the, the, currently the deputy global representative of this very extraordinary group of, of people. Um, the program is executed by the Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea, and gender equality um, plays a key role in, in it. So uh, from the overall gender balance over the 15 years that the program has been implementing, we have 52% of male representation and 48% of females. And however, in the past five years, 50% or more of the females have been consistently selected to participate in the different types of fellowships that this program provides. And also targeting um, ocean professionals from a variety of disciplines, including ocean science. Lastly, I also want to, to recall one of a, a, a good experience that we have had in regards to raising awareness on gender equality. That was our participation as an alumni group, uh, and also thanks, uh, thank you to the to Dualos, sorry, um, which uh, we participated in the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference in Nairobi that took place in November of 2018. And we organized a side event entitled Unlocking the Potential of an Inclusive Blue Economy, the Gender and Capacity Imperatives, which was a great experience for the alumni that attended, but also to highlight the critical role of women within the current discussions of blue economy. So 
I, and thank you, Valentina, for providing the, the information and the percentages of, of women representation within, within our program. Now, going straight into the topic that I will be addressing uh, today, um, I will be addressing uh, six points going from the general to the specifics. So I will start uh, with an overview of a project that I am part of now, which is entitled Emp Empowering Women for the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science. Then I will be focusing a bit more on what I am doing within this project. And also I wanted to highlight some key aspects of three intergovernmental organizations that we have been addressing within the, the project. And we'll be concluding with some summary remarks. So since, um, for, to start with the background of this uh, project, since May uh, 2018, there was support from Canada's ambassador, Heather Grant, to conduct gender equality research with the World Maritime University. In early 19, uh, 2019, sorry, there was a joint announcement by Dr. Genevieve Betchard, a hydrographer general of Canada on behalf of the government of that country, and also from uh, the World Maritime University President, uh, Dr. Cleopatra Dombey Henry. And they announced this agreement between the university and the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans. It was later that year that the Empowering Women for the UN Decade of Ocean Science program started, and it is envisioned to be a three-year uh, program. In these slides, um, I want to highlight some of the key issues of, of this uh, project, which has a dedicated gender team. Its main objective is to propose a strategy and an action plan for equal opportunities and full participation and leadership by women in ocean science. And the project has two strands, um, you will see, or building blocks. In the first one, two colleagues and PhD students from the World Maritime University that you'll see in the next slide are focusing their research on the role of gender equality and empowerment of women in the conduct of ocean science. And the second building block or strand is where I am focusing my work and uh, I will be extending more on, on this other one, which is gender equality in the regulatory and ocean science governance systems. Uh, we need to establish a baseline of information through the engagement with these intergovernmental organizations addressing marine science, and that's the work that I am doing uh, within the program. This is the project team. As I mentioned before, uh, my two colleagues that are focusing on the first uh, strand of the project are Ellen and Brennis. We are supported and also guided uh, within the execution of the project uh, by a very great group of professionals, uh, Dr. Jen Sun, Professor Ronan Long, that is the director of the Global Ocean Institute within the World Maritime University. Uh, we also have the support and valuable guidance of Professor Clive Schofield, uh, Dr. Momoku Kitara, Professor Susan Buckingham, and Professor Francis Neat. Now, focusing more on what I've been doing so far in the program and, and also focusing on the key element that I am presenting today that it's gender mainstreaming in ocean governance bodies. So the strand of the project that I am working on, it's related, it's related to the exploring gender equality and the role of women in governance bodies that are related to ocean science. So here, it's a key issue to engage with these intergovernmental organizations that are this group of organizations that we have identified to be addressed within the project. It involves um, the, um, the International Seabed Authority, the International Hydrographic Organization, the Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea, DUALOS, FAO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, and from the non-governmental uh, partners, we will be working with the High Seas Alliance. So the starting task, uh, it's data collection on key research issues um, because there's a, a broad array of information regarding gender equality and women empowerment. We decided to focus on five key elements 
to be addressed within the work that we will be doing with these intergovernmental organizations. And these five elements that you see in these slides are the ones that I will be highlighting in the three international organizations that I will be talking about. Um, important maybe just also to mention that uh, by now I was supposed to be traveling to the secretariat sort of these international organizations, but due to uh, travel bans and COVID restrictions, it hasn't been possible to do it so far. So uh, that information is the, the one that we have gathered from the, um, these in institutions websites and also in other forums. So, uh, in regards to the, these five key elements, um, you'll see in the next slide that I'll be referring to gender policy and action plans. If these organizations have designated gender focal points, if there are capacity or education programs in place and how the numbers of women are playing there, official commitments on gender and notions, and also if these organizations have been doing some uh, raising of awareness through publications and events. So starting with that first uh, international organization, it's the International Seabed Authority. Here, the ISA has a voluntary commitment on enhancing the role of women in marine scientific research through capacity building. Uh, ISA has a strategic plan that includes some preferences on uh, the promotion of measures to strengthen the role of women in deep sea uh, deep seabed related activities and also on how to strengthen the participation in their capacity building programs. Uh, ISA has a designated focal point, Marie Burrell, and also a a training coordinator in the contract management unit is Aneka Mason and I will be referring to a, a very good report that she has done trying to get the numbers and uh, statistics of women participating in ISA's uh, capacity building programs. So from the overall uh, gender representation across ISA capacity building programs, there's a 59% of rep uh, representation of male and 41% of women. Here, I want to draw your attention, as I mentioned before, Aneka Mason has uh, done a report uh, in 2018, trying to get these statistics and also considering a time frame from 2009 until 2017. Currently, I say has for uh, ongoing capacity building programs. Uh, the first one is the contractor training program. Here it's important to take uh, into account that the authorities contractors have a legal uh, obligation to provide fund training opportunities for trainees coming from developing states. So the numbers here uh, are representative of those uh, developing states uh, participants. In the first, um, Sorry, there are also types of, of training within this program, for example, at sea training, engineering, a fellowship, masters, PhD programs. A, we can see that there's a 31% of female representation and 69% of male. In relation to the second a, capacity building program, that is the endowment fund, fund for marine scientific research, we have similar numbers. A, there's a 38% of female representation and 62 of male. In the internship program, we see like a flip of the numbers and we see that there is more representation of female females uh, than men. Um, this internship program usually takes place in ISA's headquarters in Jamaica. And finally, ISA has a, the Africa Deep Seabed Resources Project, where um, geology, ocean affairs, and blue economy uh, elements are addressed in this project. And there's the participation of five women. Then uh, the nomination of female candidates is strongly encouraged by ISA within uh, its member states. In relation to senior leadership uh, positions, so this is uh, like a, a photograph of how the International Civic Authority governing bodies are. Uh, since the creation of the authority 50, uh, 25 years ago, this is the first time that three women are in key positions uh, 
within their governing bodies. So we have presi the president of the assembly, Kamina Johnson from Jamaica. We have the president of the council, Lomka Jongeni from South Africa. And we also have the chair of the legal and technical committee, Michelle Walker from Jamaica. In relation to awareness on gender empowerment, ISA and other stakeholders have organized a diversity of workshops, side events, uh, annual publications, reports, and, and briefings to showcase the importance of uh, women empowerment. Moving into our second uh, international organization, it's the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, or IOC. So IOC strategies respond uh, to UNESCO global priorities, which are gender and Africa. IOC has developed some uh, elements within its strategies, uh, calling for equal presence in the marine science community, uh, to promote activities that include women in science, and also how women scientists could be enhanced as a role model for young women. Uh, IOC has been advancing also in its draft medium-term strategy to cover the years of 2022 until 2029, increasing the presence of senior leadership roles and also providing disaggregated data or information on women in marine science. Here, it's very important um, also to highlight that this disaggregated data uh, helps to make more visible where women are working and where they are participating and being represented. In relation to a uh, women representation in decision-making bodies, this is IOC structure uh, governance. Here uh, for the la in the last assembly, there was approximately 30 representatives from member states participating uh, in, the, um, in this assembly that were women. And in relation to uh, raising awareness on gender empowerment, IOC uh, has included some brief references on gender action lines within its assemblies report. Uh, IOC has also organized workshops and side events, and uh, they have in their website a dedicated section on women marine scientists, uh, that, that it's also enhancing these uh, role models for younger scientists. Lastly, moving into our third uh, international organization to be addressed this morning, it's the Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, when reviewing FAO's gender policy information, you can see that there's like three big elements addressed um, on gender policy. So it's fisheries, research, and agriculture and rural development. This last one uh, from the information that I reviewed, I think is the one that has been more, um, that has more details on, on gender policies. So FAO has a policy on gender equality and it addresses fisheries, knowledge and exchange, knowledge exchange, sorry, and research. And other gender policies that inform FAO uh, work, it's also the 2012 um, UN System Action Plan, Plan for Gender Equality, and also the voluntary guidelines um, for small-scale fisheries that has a specific chapter on gender mainstreaming. More recently, uh, the World Fisheries and Aquaculture Report of this year mentions the need to adopt a gender lens in the collection of data, and also uh, the empowerment of women through SDG 5 in relation to marketing of fish and the post-harvest processing of fisheries products. Here again, having gender disaggregated data is needed to make visible the role of women in the post-harvest fisheries contributions. In relation to gender focal points, uh, FAO has a system rather than a designated person. So it's a network of officers at the headquarters and other decentralized offices. Uh, there's also a variety of specialist job posts on women empowerment, and there has been a, some ge a regional gender trainings. In relation to capacity building programs, uh, I, uh, there is the women uh, scientists aboard the Nansen. So the Nansen is a Norwegian research vessel that has a coordination, uh, a cooperation agreement with FAO, where uh, it is encouraged the participation of women scientists and researchers. 
Lastly, uh, in relation to gender focus areas within FAO, uh, some key elements, for example, mainstream gender in projects and programs, uh, also to develop gender responsive interventions, the improvement of reporting, and also having uh, this inclusiveness in decision making and capacity building uh, targets are also highlighted within FAO's gender policies. However, I also wanted to highlight that we, we need to have like this critical reading because these organizations, and, and I, I'm sure that they have worked and advanced in these action lines and strategies, but, but also we need to have this critical reading on the implementation phase of these uh, policies and action lines. Um, and there's still some references on lack of gender information of inadequate resources a disconnection between policy and practice, and also a lack of active leadership in some forms. So in concluding, uh, I wanted to have some summary remarks um, regarding the World Maritime University and the Global Ocean Institute Gender Program. Uh, this program seeks for transformative change on gender equality. Uh, one of the key objectives is to propose a strategy on women empowerment in science dependent governance systems. Also, we're um, actively participating in global forums, for example, the negotiation process of the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty. Uh, there's a key element on capacity building within these negotiations and having gender sen sensitive provisions with, will really make a difference and also taking into account that we don't have uh, currently law of the sea instruments with gender specific provisions so this would be like a historical opportunity that we can take advantage of also the project team uh, has been working in the consultations of the un decade of ocean science and um, it's also again our one of our goals to raise awareness through events publications and other capacity building sessions more specifically on the IGOs or the intergovernmental organizations that I've presented, all of them have gender policies in place, action lines, action lines sorry, and, and some strategies. However, updated statistics on the implementation of those gender targets and, and indicators would be desirable to be reflected. The gender focal points are managed in different formats within the three organizations that I presented on. So ISA has a, de a designated person, IOC is complemented also by UNESCO's Gender Equality Division, and FAO has a network of focal points. All IGOs have capacity building and education programs, uh, however, ones are more specialized than others on marine science. In relation to official commitments on gender and oceans, only ISA has a specific voluntary commitment on enhancing the role of women in marine scientific research. And FAO and IOC commitments, they respond to a broader uh, gender strategic objectives from United Nations agencies. All IGOs have done publications on gender equality and also have organized different formats of events to raise awareness. And finally, and also uh, getting into this also critical reading of the information that we have, is that there's a possible disconnection between policy and practice. Uh, for example, in regards to effective women representation in decision-making bodies or senior leadership positions. Also in relation to data on progress in these gender targets implementation and a need of greater, uh, greater engagement. So that would be for me uh, the, the presentation that I want to share with you. I'm also looking forward um, to our Q&A session later on. Um, thank you, Maria Amalia, for actually taking us within these institutions and seeing what they are doing or not doing and what the challenges they are facing. Um, let me now give, oh, before giving the floor, I just wanted to remind everyone that there is going to be a Q&A session in which you can all 
ask questions or for or clarifications. And it's going to be after the, the other two speakers. And you can insert your uh, questions or comments in the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of, your, of, the, of the screen that you can see. So if you write there your question, I will try to make sure that I um, allow all the panelists to address them. So now let me give the floor to the second and third speakers, which are Lisa Winnie and Gina Yaodro. Lisa Winnie is, one, is part of the One Ocean Hub and is a PhD uh, researcher at the Strathclyde Center for Environmental Law and Governance. And, and she is also a Nippon Fellow alumni. She's from the Solomon Island and her research is currently focusing on the influence of the British Empire on indigenous coastal communities and the contemporary national ocean laws in Solomon Islands. So Lisa, please, I'll give you the floor. Thank you, Julia. Good morning from um, Solomon Islands. It's very early, 1 a.m. Um, so um, forgive me if I'm slow. Um, <laughs> Today I'll be presenting um, basically my perspective um, coming as a woman coming from a very patriarchal society and where there's low representation of women in decision making in ocean affairs. Um, I like to call my um, talk, there is an I in identity, our ocean, our linkage and identity. So we often think of the ocean for everything that is wrong with it. It wrecks havoc through the cyclones that form over it, tsunamis, man-eating saltwater crocodiles or sharks, the systems that govern it, the many competing industries on or in it, we are inclined to view the ocean as a divide, a barrier, an obstacle that is both ruthless and challenging. But many of us come from village communities, born near vast expanses of ocean water. Our communities for centuries have thrived on everything that the ocean provides and have built systems to govern it. But this positive aspect of the ocean is often overshadowed by our own misconception of the ocean and its associated governance structures. Um, we don't hold the same view of the land because many systems are designed to work well on land. Land is malleable. Um, you can feel it, feel it, see the fruits of your labor. Many of our governance systems are designed to address land issues. It is even easier to travel because Let's face it, a car ride is often much more comfortable than three hours in a dugout canoe. Today, we're faced with another reality. There is obviously a lot of negativity surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. In Solomon Islands, our prime minister um, reiterated that in spite of global anxiety, this pro pandemic provides opportunity. And this is what I want to focus on. But what exactly are these opportunities? On a personal level, a lot of personal reflection. Most citizens take greater interest in their personal well being. Most are inspired to safeguard their health, reevaluate career choices, investigate investment opportunities despite a seemingly bleak future. It has been a time of thoughtful reflections. At the national level, there has been an elevated sense of consciousness. The absence of basic necessities we've always taken for granted has certainly provided incentive for individuals at various levels to embrace the challenge of employing or even experimenting with different strategies. Of course, I have no empirical evidence, but I observe that the mood has certainly shifted. It is very real. So I feel that it is imperative that we take a closer look at various examples of the kind of opportunities that are available during this global pandemic to accelerate gender mainstreaming in ocean affairs. And this can be done by how we control our narrative. Narratives are crucial in shaping our responses. We need a narrative that truly reflects our realities and under these circumstances provide opportunities to craft solutions that matter. As a Pacific woman, is it not true that it was along these ocean currents that we sailed to find home? Isn't it also the same waters that we travel on to trade, to bata, and to discover new islands, but most important, sustain our life? It is our highway. In the ocean, um, in the Asian continent, it is our Silk Road. In the United States, it is our Route 66. 
It is the one thing that connects all our islands as one nation. So it doesn't make sense for us to see the ocean as the connecting force in our story and not lose sight during this uncertain times. We must use these moments in solitude to appreciate that the ocean sustains life and lends itself as our connection to others around us. So we must learn of what systems already exist in our countries that ensure we maintain an equilibrium between us and the ocean. It is an opportunity to understand governance structures at the community, at the national level, the community actors, men and women, that shape traditional ocean management in our communities. What did they do? How did they do it? Why did they do it? I grew up as a little girl, conflicted by identity. I lived all my life in the city, but I am not from the city. So do I belong here or there? A dear friend of mine usually teased me saying, you are from Bull Valley, my residential area in the city. Should I call myself a Malaitan, the province that I'm from? Truth be told, Malaita is an island holiday getaway more than it is home. But even then, am I Aitolo or Ayasi, from the land or from the sea? Do I belong to the Imolaitolo, people of the land, or Imolaiasi, people of the sea? Should I claim ancestry through Wanaitolo, people of the land, or Wanaiasi, people of the sea? The complexity of this identity crisis is not trivial, nor is it simple. Identity is closely entwined with ownership. Ownership over land, or in my case, the sea. It is an intimate relationship. The land or sea, me and identity. I am of this sea, the Ayasi, woman of the sea. I owe that claim from my mother through her lineage from the one Ayasi, I'm also a mother, so my children are perfectly entitled to call, call themselves Welayasi or children of the sea. In traditional Solomon Island villages like New Leni, where my mother is from, the Yasi or ocean is an integral part of their lives. The same can be said of many island communities in Solomon Islands. In such communities, women play a pivotal role. If you were to imagine a coastal dwelling, or in my case, an artificial island community, you will no doubt recognize the Ayasi's role in fishery. They are gleaners, fisherwomen, fish sellers, or a policy worker like me. So to in effectively contribute to ocean management, we have to know ourselves, where we've been, where we are now and where we want to be in the future. This crisis gives us that time to know ourselves. We need to also recognize that there is a tension between community and national work. The lack thereof in recognizing that we as ind indigenous women working in policy space, that if supported can make more meaningful impact in ocean management. I like to draw a case from logging in Solomon Islands, 80% of our national revenue comes from logging, so this is a real threat on our ocean health. But a month ago, the Permanent Secretary for Forestry, a man, he is a highly regarded person in his village. He is chair of a local conservation group on his land island and a trustee of the board of directors on the only sustainable logging company operating on his island. Recognizing that the mountain forest above 400 meters from sea level are significant to his people's spirit, spirituality, culture, identity, and it's their source of life, he pushed for the law to be amended using the Forestry Timber Felling Licensing Act, Section 13.1c, and simply removing powers from the Commission of Forests, which gives outright protection from logging on all areas above 400 meters. He knew who he is, where he came from, and what future he wants for his people. He connected these two spaces using his influence to navigate between and within the modern ind indigenous sovereignty which he lives in. This is something we as women can learn from. In the Pacific, and maybe the globe, we see community as villagers still living in lift huts, disconnected from the state, but in the Solomon Islands, every city dwellers still own and have rights to village areas 
and still actively migrate between these spaces. But Western teachings have taught us to shy away from our indigenous identity when we are in our professional spaces. So we unknowingly participate in further disconnecting our life and state, especially in decision-making over ocean affairs. I was fortunate to lead our nationwide ocean planning process in Solomon Islands last year. During the ocean planning process, um, we ensure our process was gender ba balanced and giving leadership role to young women from sectors that were involved. We built our approach on who we are first as people of the land and sea, and what can we do together to plan for a healthier ocean. The process allowed for self-discovery and confidence in speaking about our way of life with ourselves, the villages, our local communities, and the government. We, the women, discovered the power we have, and we confidently participated in decisions during the planning process. The COVID crisis is helping us to see our realities clearer, and it should be utilized to look for processes that we could use to support each other and to discover the powers within us. So my message today can be summed up in three ways. Our current reality is challenging us to first change the narrative by shifting commonly held views of the ocean as a divide. Let's focus on rebuilding systems, both legislative and policy that enhance our ability to better manage ocean resources. Systems that appreciate where we come from and where we are now and focus less attention on the divide allowing us to embrace pathways that bring us closer together as a collective force. Second, identity. Know yourself, who you are. It is through that self-indulgent analysis can you truly see the I in identity. Recognizing that I is our first step to appreciating what you and I can do to identify how we can bring our islands closer and overcome the physical challenges that prevents us from contributing positively to ocean management. We must seek to better understand how I am part of governance structures, customary law, church, or state. It, it is also in acknowledging our traditional knowledge of resource management in our respective communities that we can have meaningful participation in decision-making. We must challenge ourselves. While national legislation speaks of participation by communities, it does little to provide us a meaningful role within decision-making bodies established by law. The lack of productive participation in part due to our severe malnourishment on understanding our own identity. We as women in the policy space need to be confident, speak out for our co local communities. And finally, COVID-19 has posed significant challenges, but it also provides opportunities. I think gender mainstreaming under these circumstances should not be a challenge if we spend more time to take a reflective look on oneself and what our stories are. I am part of nation sustained by the ocean. I am also a woman. I make a significant proportion of our population. I also operate in a very complex system, which is very different to the rest of the world. But when we focus on the community spaces we belong to, the national and international dialogues we participate in like today, we will clearly see where we belong in the grand scheme of things. The pathway to enlightenment begins when we seek to know ourselves because in knowing ourselves, we can con confidently contribute to dialogues that shape legislations and policies to achieve gender mainstreaming. Tage Tumas. Uh, hi, Lisa, for this very passionate presentation, which couldn't have been more, we couldn't have taken us to a far away from um, what Maria Mara actually spoke to us, but it shows how gender issues and gender mainstreaming is everywhere. It's something that is talks in, that it brings us to the very functioning of international organization, but also to communities, to, the, to identities, to the perception of the I, of the role that we as women have in our, for our communities, families, and, uh, and for the world and oceans as well. Um, 
Let me now introduce Gina Yaodro, who is the current director of the Center for Gender Research, Advocacy and Documentation at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. She is also part of the Ocean Hub, for which she leads the research package aspect of the Ghanaian research on the ethnography of tangible and intangible heritage, ocean governance and women and youth in coastal communities. She is also part of the team which is responsible for the hub for gender mainstreaming and for safeguarding in the hub together with Rose Bowell and Catherine Mohula of Maseno University in Kenya. Before giving her the floor, let me remind you of the Q&A section uh, of the Q&A function and of the fact that you can start um, typing your questions also during the presentation so that I can then collect them at the end and put them together for the panelists. I have noted that Maria Mala was already, was already started to answer some questions, typing them. So some answers will be provided uh, uh, through the, the panelist typings, others will be presented by me and then vocally uh, responded. So uh, Gina, please, the floor is yours and thank you for being with us today. Gina, I don't think we can hear you. You have to unmute yourself because you're muted. Should be up on the top. Should say like there's a there's this a small box that says uh, mute or unmute. Mm. Uh, good afternoon from yes. my part of the yes. world. <laughs> So I'm coming from Ghana and it's quite sunny this afternoon. It's a beautiful afternoon, but I know some of you are having morning, others are having evening. So as you introduce, yes, I'm with the University of Cape Coast. I'm a lecturer with the University of Cape Coast. So, um, and I was also born on the coast. So I grew up in a city known as Tema, which is a coastal mm -hmm. city. And I'm now working with the University of Cape Coast, which is on the coast. So every blessed I happen to see the sea. And I'm always reminded of the sea whenever I pass by and I see it, I'm reminded of our project. So I'll try to, um, I'll try to share my screen. I have a few, a few slides to share. That's what I'm trying to, okay, so great. Um, is it visible to all of you, my, my screen? Great. Okay, so um, I'm looking at gender and then um, it, how it's been impacted by the COVID, but also within the framework of the ocean um, governance or ocean economy. And um, I decided to take it from a very, very basic approach because I do know that with the audience, we have people from different backgrounds and we are so happy to have Mariama taking us from the macro level in terms of the structures, the UN structures, the FAO and all those organizations. And then Lisa also took us from the micro level. I also positioned myself within the micro level using Ghana as a case study. So that is where I'm coming from with this presentation. And as we are all aware, gender is quite um, basically, it's the meaning given to being a, a man or a woman in different societies. And when we are talking about gender, diversity issues come in. In our One Ocean Research Hub, we have different countries involved. We have, for example, the Pacific Island. We have South Africa in there. We have Ghana on board. And then we also have the UK, Kenya, and some other countries in there. So there are diversity issues within the hub which makes diversity quite important when we are talking about gender mainstreaming and then safeguarding issues. Also, we have people from different backgrounds. It's quite interdisciplinary in that we have people from the hard sciences and we also have people from the soft sciences like sociology and anthropology. So in looking at our work in gender, we look at all these diversity issues. We do know that when we're talking about gender, um, as Simon de Beauvoir said far back in his book, The Second Gender, one is not born gender, but one becomes gendered through the society. So in the society, different institutions prepare us, take us through, and then make us the gendered masculine and feminine beings that we grow up into. Among them is the home, which is the basic institution. We have the school through its processes, the curriculum, through the register, duties in school. We have religion 
contributing to our genderedness. We have the media through books that it's published, the literature that we read, the films that we watch, the stories that we hear, sometimes the adverts that we come across all preparing us for our gendered beings. But we're also careful and aware that gender is sociocultural, so it differs from society to society. So some of the gendered issues might not be the same as in the Pacific or as in Colombia or as in the UK. We are very mindful of that. We also do appreciate that at the communities within which we grow prepare us into being gendered beings and also our peers also prepare us into our gendered beings. And within this gendered preparedness, from um, birth through to forever, uh, hierarchies are established whereby power differences are established. So here, um, through our gender socialization, through the exposure that we get, we have some occupying higher positions over the other. So hierarchies are established. Differences are also on earth. We have power inequalities coming up. There are resource implications because there's no, not everyone may have things at the same level. If we re refer back to the presentation by Lisa, for example, there are different growing up in a resource environment, growing up in a rural area, growing up on the coast, growing up and all the implication that it has. So it goes with resource implication. There are class issues in here as well. And all these manifest in the society at different levels. So we have gender issues at the workplace. We have gender issues within the ocean economy, for example. We have gender issues in the blue economy. And in our one ocean research hub, for example, there are gender issues, which is of importance for which reason we have a team um, looking at gender mainstreaming within the ocean. So the question is, Within this genderedness, our gender preparedness, or our gender socialization through which we become our gendered beings, uh, masculinity issues evolve. And then those concerning women and children also evolve, including those within the ocean environment. I'll be linking this up to um, the ocean very soon, but I have a short clip that I would want us to watch. And at this point, I will invite, Mar is it Maria? Um, yeah, Laura, or uh, yeah, no, no, to, to show the film and then afterwards I'll continue with my presentation. Thank you. One second. Now everything in this world has to shut all the way down to nobody has to go anywhere because of their shutdown. The ice cream, the ice cream truck is shut down, and, and the ice and the water truck place is to shut down, which is my favorite part because it, because it is my favorite one. What's that? Yeah, it has the gumball one where there's gumballs and there's like blues. And now they have to shut all the way down and we can't go anywhere. Not even McDonald's, which is my favorite restaurant. You can pick up McDonald's in the drive-thru. No, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> you can't. You can. You can go in the drive-thru, but you can't go in the playground. Yeah, it's just really frustrating. You, the, if you go through the drive-thru, it's just boring because you have to wait for your view to go. And if you're inside playing on the playground, it wouldn't be boring. <laughs> and now they have to shut down. <laughs> it's just boring when you wait for food to come. Yeah. And now that everything in this town has to shut all the way down. And I just don't want it to do that. I mean, why would germs come around to people if they don't want germs to come around to them? I know. Because everyone doesn't like germs because they get sick and and everything has to be shut down for everybody to be safe. Yeah. And it's just not fair because everything that is fun also has to be shut down. Yeah. And the only thing that that is open is nothing. Nothing. Except homes, cars. Nothing. Yeah, and actually maybe church too. We can't go to church. Yeah, and it's just really fun. We're going home church, so that's why we're doing church on the TV, right? Yeah, but but the 
real church. It's Heroes Academy, and you get to get candy and toys. And if you have a big number, you can get two. Wow. Like Play-Doh, candy. And once I got that fish kind, and it's just... I only wanted... I only wanted to have fun with Play-Doh, so I bought it, and now the, everything in this world has to be shut down. And it's not fair, because my damage. I'm sorry. It's a lot, huh? And it won't last forever. Yeah, just for a few weeks. Yeah. But well, we're doing so everybody can be safe, right? Mom, tomorrow will I be able to play on my iPad? <laughs> Oh. Thank you, Blake. I appreciate it very much. I love you very much. Sure. Just now, everything in this world has to shut all the way down to nobody has to go anywhere because of their shutdown. The ice cream, the ice cream truck is shut down. Okay, um, thank you very much, and you are all welcome. So um, I'm speaking on gender, but also within the context of the impact of COVID, and then it, how that will inform gender mainstream within the ocean. One may wonder, what is the essence of this video? I actually saw a lot in it, and I first need to acknowledge that it's not my production, but I found it on social media, and I couldn't resist looking at its relevance. So we're looking at COVID and how COVID has impacted on society and how COVID has impacted on different generations of the society. So for example, um, look at watching the video, you realize that the impact of COVID is not only on adults, but even on children. Even on children. I don't know what is happening. Please, can you see my slide? Does it reflect at your end? Hello. Hello, can you uh, hear no, me? We can see. Uh, yeah, we can hear, but we, we don't see the slides. You have to, okay. I think, share screen again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Okay, so what I'm saying uh, is that the film that we just, the short clip that we just watched, one may wonder what is its essence, but I saw a lot in it. And when I watched this clip, I had not even been assigned this, I uh, have not even been invited to be part of this team, but I couldn't resist it. Looking at the impact of COVID and how, and this genderedness, how it's actually impacting on families, on different sectors of the economy within the Ghanaian society, including the ocean sector. So if we, depend, if there was time, we were going to have a breakout group and then look at the impact in relation to children. But you are free to share some of what you pick through chats regarding what we just saw. In my case, with the children, COVID comes with shutdown or lockdown, where you can't even go out, where her favorite restaurant, McDonald's, can't even be accessible to her, where she cannot go to church, where she's not having the chance to play with her friends. And then personally, as a parent, uh, my children have been home since the lockdown. Parents in Ghana are allowed to go to work after different uh, levels, shutdown, partial shutdown, and all that. We can go to work now, but children are still not in school. Those second, secondary school and university students are writing exams. The exam candidates are in school, but children are not in school. So you realize that COVID is having huge impact on different groups of the society. And this is why I introduced the concept of diversity. Because when we're talking about gender, it's not solely on women or is it solely on men, but issues about diversity comes in. And here we saw the child and how COVID has impacted on her. It definitely impacted on women. If we look at the blue economy, including the fishery sector, for example, in Ghana, Women have really been, Ghanaian society has about 52% um, women and then 48% males. And most women are in the informal economy. So when it comes to trading, when it comes to fishery sector, they are into the processing industry. They could go for the fish, smoke, and then sell it. In the course of this, they encounter lots of risk. So COVID is impacting on different groups of people. It has increased women's care role. It has 
really impacted on livelihood strategies within the Ghanaian context. And this should be of essence to us as gender activists, as gender researchers, as those within the gender sector, for which reason I found the flip quite important. Um, in the Ghanaian context also, as it re relates to other African contexts, but also in other low income countries, men have equally been impacted, for which reason diversity becomes key again. Because when it comes to COVID, within the fishing sector, we have three sectors, the artisanal, which is small scale fisheries, we have the semi um, industrial, and then we have the industrial fishing sectors in the country. And most people are within the artisanal, which is a small scale fishing sector. And during the lockdown, there was no way you could go fishing. And most people depend on only fishing as their livelihood. They don't have alternative livelihoods. So being impacted or being locked down because of COVID meant that uh, the breadwinner, me, me, most of the time being the male, is suffering. What about the uh, mother? What about the children? So the whole household was impacted with the presence of COVID. We had instances where uh, our fisher folks go to neighboring countries like Togo, um, like Ivory Coast, like um, Abidjan uh, and, and Co. And they were arrested because it was COVID time and there was lockdown. So it's equally impacted on all these people. Families have been impacted. When it comes to the health sector, COVID has had huge impacts. I know that it's global phenomenon. So this is not only in Ghana. Luckily, Ghanaian, because of the tropics, our cases have not been so bad. Currently, we have about 36,000 infection rates, and then the recoveries have been very high, over 30,000 recoveries. So active cases are about 4,000, 5,000 thereabouts. And the death rate has been very low, around 200, not even up to 300. But still, frontline workers have been infected. They've had to be locked down. Um, they, they sometimes away from families and co. So they've been impacted by it. The psychological and the mental health challenges have been devastating. I recall that personally, as a researcher, as a lecturer, when the crisis started and when we weren't very clear about it, dynamics, when we had not understood it, some of us were even afraid to watch the international news because CNN was reporting serious death cases in Brazil currently, it is happening. And then bodies being backed here and there. Um, in the UK, the death rate was high. In Italy, it was equally very high. And this did not just impact the countries involved, but even observers from afar. And it had impact on researchers. Um, so that takes us to the next, the various careers, profession and sectors, including the ocean. So with the One Ocean Hub, for example, the presence of COVID has stalled our progress regarding the research. We had to reorganize our timelines. We had to reorganize our, our plans in a whole lot. Currently, we were to be going to the field in some countries, but because of COVID and its implication, all these things have been stalled. So COVID has really had serious effects on the country, but it's not all negative. I've mentioned some of these things already. And there have been cases of violence. Ghana, it hasn't been too bad. We had a national lockdown for three weeks. But when you read the literature, and in some countries, COVID really ignited the whole uh, issue of violence, and especially against women and children. Because being locked down in sometimes a small apartment for a long time, you get fed up with yourself, you want to have access to. So COVID has also had that kind of challenge. But COVID is not all negative, like we heard from Lisa. There have been some few positive instances, at least. Presence of COVID is causing us to rethink as researchers, as academics, as gender activists, as um, advocates, um, and then also think about different sectors within the ocean and the blue economy itself. Because the blue economy is not limited to fisheries. And in our context, the hotel industry has really suffered because leisure, recreation, and I know it's the uh, same in most countries, all these things have been seriously impacted. And also, what about the voices and experiences and then heritage of, of women, children, and other marginalized groups that, if you are not careful, can be silenced because of COVID? Because going, going through research, giving them opportunity to share their views is one thing. But also, even the dynamics that COVID has brought about said that maybe the breadwinner role will have to change, um, the headship role of households will have to change, all has implication for um, voices of women and then the conservation or continuation 
of heritage. There is also that tendency because COVID is a pandemic which just emerged. So it has affected world economies. And those of us in low middle income countries have really had the shock because um, during the annual budget, there was nothing like set aside for COVID, but COVID came and it blew everything apart, which presupposes that if we are not careful as a people, as a people looking at gender mainstreaming, the tendency to focus all resources on COVID and the fighting of COVID to the neglect of women and other marginalized groups is something else that should also strike us. And it also presupposes that especially those in the informal economy who have been highly devastated by the pandemic, including those in ocean related sectors in small uh, scale countries or low economies need to be given more attention. So what COVID is saying is that, yes, it has come. It was unexpected. It wasn't all negative, but there have been some possible uh, positives in terms of rethinking, in terms of reorientation, in terms of research. For example, in undertaking research with the safeguarding, with the gender mainstreaming, we have to consciously set aside something for COVID and its impact now, COVID has become a key research, just like the SDG goals. There's no way one can go about research without the COVID implications. So it has taken a mainstream position in research, which calls to attention. Another positive thing we saw, for example, in the Ghanaian context was that with the COVID, the environment really sort of rested. And this has implication for the ocean the big sea out there because uh, in our study with the tangible and intangible heritage for example questions regarding the perception of people regarding on, about the sea some see the sea as a big risk obstacle that takes everything in including plastics including filth including everything so when the covid pandemic intensified and then there were the lockdowns and others in my country for example the environment rested the few times you walk around, you realize that the environment was so quiet. It was green, the refuse and other things because people were not around to throw things around. So COVID has been a big issue. It calls attention to gender mainstreaming. It calls attention to researchers. It calls attention to bodies like the UN, FAO and CO, but it's also not all negative. So on this point, I will end my presentation and then we can get into the Q&A section. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Gina, for taking us to another level of, of gender mainstreaming and understanding that gender cannot be, um, gender issues cannot be faced if we don't look at the real diversity of, of people. So that includes children and that include indigenous people, that include everyone, not just men and women but actually much more diverse to view his vision of the world and that is yeah the real uh, key to to face uh, overall all challenges that we have in environmental issues but also healthcare and education and 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 everything and also thank you for um underlying some of the well maybe positive is a too strong word but the well, yeah, the, the, the good aspects, the, the, the good things that COVID pandemic led us to at least face and see and, um, you know, and having to understand, for example, that our environmental impact, how it can be reduced in a way uh, that is actually very, though, um, uh, negative for uh, small fisheries or for other people that do their, they have their everyday livelihood based on going out of their house. So thank you for raising all these many challenges. And now without further ado, we have our last 20 minutes for our Q&A session. Uh, we have already received quite a few questions. I, I will try to put some of them together uh, and I will uh, send them all to you, uh, speaker, speakers and panelists. Um, First of all, we have Professor Salma that from, um, from Bangladesh that is inviting us to really um, see and, uh, that gender-based empowerment is a combination of economic, social, cultural and access to education and to healthcare issues. And therefore, in, in India, but also in now in the whole world, what is needed is a very strong academic and institutional collaboration. He is asking us to consider this and I invite you all to consider this in all the question and in all the answers that you will if you will give. So as a specific question I will uh, I will start with one for uh, Lisa. 
um, who, okay, Zen San um, is saying, I would like to ask whether you could comment on the role of indigenous women in contributing to knowledge generating, community development and decision making in the ocean sector, whether it is from national, regional or international level. Also, whether you could share as to where to find some resources on indigenous people's contribution to ocean science. Thank you. Thank you, um, Julia, and thank you, Zen, for that um, interesting question. Um, first, I want to also um, have a clarity here as well when I talk indigenous women. Um, I'm talking about indigenous women in, a, uh, in an indigenous sovereignty context. So this is where um, the, the, the people in the country are also at the decision making they have the powers of the decision making in the state and they live in the villages as well so there's rights they have rights to land and resources for solomon island 80 percent of the land is customary including 20 percent of the ocean is owned by the people so this is what i mean by indigenous um so yes um for where i'm coming from that we're just at this place of discovering that there's a disconnect on how we've been perceiving ourselves. Um, we're, we're always shifting. Um, at the, at the, when we're at our homes, we're, we can talk about customs, we can do the way we do in the villages, but then we come in the workplaces and we're different. We're adopting that two systems. So we're, we're I, I could say we're experts in living in a dual system. Um, and so, we have just recently realized that um, we need to understand these roles better. And there's not much, not much research done. And this is where I'm interested in. It's about understanding in my context, this indigenous sovereignty context, what are our roles are that we could shift between these two systems. So when you ask about research, there's not much that has been done yet that I could offer from my context. Um, but from other, other contexts like indigenous people in Amazons, probably there's, uh, there's literatures, there's, um, but not for my context. Yes. And it's a very important part that we start to study our role as indigenous women in our context. Okay, so um, coming from the Ghanaian context, we also have quite um, indigenous group of people. And I think this applies to us. For example, with the One Ocean Research Projects, we are looking at customary laws and how these, so the customary laws are often oral. They are often not written, but they are observed and then they are practiced and they are imbibed. So in our research on with the One Ocean Project, we're looking at customary laws from different coastal areas, communities, indigenous people, including traditional leaders and co. And then how we can document these things so that it infiltrates to the national level and then gradually from the different country contests to the global level or the UN level to make it binding in the area of ocean governance in the area of conflict and coal. So we have that. Um, readily, I cannot give you literature sources. Like um, Lisa said there, there's not much research on it, but gradually it is gaining a lot of attention in the African context. So African studies departments, linguistics departments, African literature and co are giving attention to indigenous knowledge. But later I can send some um, references, but readily not. And we've also realized that even in research projects, people are turning to African-based epistemologies and ontolo ontological frameworks, which they didn't use to be the case. And they are referring to African academics in this regard. So it's something that is gradually, but it's not that sort of popular and then concrete on the ground, but it's something that is gradually gaining attention in our context. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now there's a question for Maria Male uh, from Kome Hade Kupukoli. Sorry for if I if I misread the names of people, but it's really challenging when it's from the whole world. Hi, um, so hi, Maria Mala, thank you for your insightful presentation. 
Most women in fisheries are usually the traders and processors. What will your opinion be in encouraging women to engage more at the beginning of the supply chain in fisheries, particularly in small scale fisheries? Of course, then after Maria Mala, everybody else, everybody else can give replies. Thank you, Yula, and thank you, Come, for a very interesting question. I do have to say that disclaimer that I am not a gender expert. I focus more on law of the sea, and the uh, expert that I imagine that could also bring more insightful uh, reply would be my colleague Renes uh, within the World Maritime University because uh, her research is focusing on small scale fisheries. However, I can give it a try. Um, I think that apart from the encouragement of a woman to take these decisions. To, to participate more actively in, in, in spaces that are not the usual ones for women to be uh, represented or participated in. It, there's another element that you also have to consider, for example, social or cultural structures that can also influence. Uh, and, and I think that not only in small scale fisheries, but in other uh, areas. The balance of the time of the women taking uh, responsibilities at home can also compete with these other uh, areas that you could also go on and, and really make a, a difference and start working in. Uh, and I think that the other important point that I've also heard from my colleagues in the, in the project team is that um, it's kind of difficult to also have like the reflection of the reality of women participating in these areas if you don't have statistics or if you don't have a uh, disaggregated uh, gender data. So uh, making that first step on visualizing where women are uh, really working. I think that you're right saying that most of the, the numbers or the information that we have is that women are participating in this secondary phase of, of the fisheries, uh, small scale fisheries sector, but, but also uh, trying to make that visible in other areas of the fisheries activity uh, takes into account uh, how we present information and, and I think that also encourages women also to take more actions on going into these other areas where uh, we're not usually present. Uh, okay, then I'm going to read another question which is, which actually takes us to this takes us an, an, well, a real case, a real life example, uh, and I find it really interesting. It is from uh, Paul Lamin from Sierra, Sierra Leone. In Sierra Leone, women have played key roles in ocean management and governance, saving, serving as ministers of government and related functions. But I noticed that these influencer women who have been taken up who have taken up these positions have contributed less in promoting women's participation in decision making that relates or relates oceans or even work in promoting the welfare of women in the marine sector. Just yesterday, the Marine of Fisheries and Marine Resources, uh, the minister, sorry, the Minister of Fisheries and Marine Resources, who happens to be a woman, donated life jackets and other safety equipment to fishermen leaving out incentives to women who participate in fish processing and marketing. Could this be the custom in other countries? So this is open to all our panelists. So who of you would like to answer? Gina? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I would want to address that and others will add their contribution to it. So like um, Paul is saying, um, Sierra Leone is a neighbor, we are all in West Africa, so our practices are quite similar. And in the Ghanaian context, also relating to Sierra Leone, we've had ministers for fisheries who are women. And interestingly, even when the Ministry of Fisheries in Ghana was started, it was a female minister and she was given a cabinet position, whereas other ministries didn't occupy those positions. But the reason why they've not managed to really empower and then women continue to sort of struggle, though they've had this representation, is because it's quite different. Um, this is just a position for one or two people and the whole society the sociocultural dynamics of the society, which is so entrenched and patriarchal, has not changed. Additionally, the level of empowerment of these women who happen to be at the grassroots and involved in the fishery sector is comparatively low. So we may have the minister up there, but then there are so many people up 
below. In Ghana, for example, within the informal sector or economy, we have about 80% of the population being women. And these are people who are comparatively low skilled and capital can be challenging and others. So yes, we have few in leadership, but then the issues on the ground are a lot and there's that huge disparity. So this calls for empowerment strategies, which some are doing, including the NGO world. We have NGOs even equipping women with um, new technologies regarding smoking, preservation of fishes and other things. But the work is quite huge and it may take some time. So this is what I know from the Ghanaian context, which can partially address Paul's question. Thank you. Hi, um, just want to chime in as well on um, and respond to that question. Um, similar to what Gina said in Ghana, um, that would be um, similar to Solomon's as well, where it's a very patriarchal system. And so you have, um, and, and also the women are mostly um, engaged in their roles as dependent um, housekeepers or, or, or their dependents to their husbands. So the husbands are the ones going up to the minister and talking to the minister or go approaching. And it's, it's also seen like women's perception here as well is that that's not their place to go and, 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 and let people know that they, are, they exist, they're there. <laughs> so it's, it's that as well that, that makes them lose out on, on receiving things. It's, for example, I had a workshop in, in Central Islands and I invited, I tried to make sure women are represented and, and only one woman came. And I asked her why, why didn't the others came and, and they say, we don't come to the workshop. It's the place for the men. The, the men do the talking, the men come and negotiate, the men come and, so that's how it is here at, um, as well. So yeah, it will take a lot of changing our narrative and um, getting everyone to see that um, no, th there's, there's this better way of doing things and it's acceptable for you to come as well and access these, these resources. Thank you. Um, Marimala, I actually wanted to ask you in connection with this question, if, if you think that is related to the lack of leadership that you were mentioning, um, and meaning lack of leadership, including when women are part of the leadership, but actually are not in the position to change things for, for their colleagues or especially at the lower le le levels. Yeah, thanks, uh, Julia, for following up on, on that comment. Uh, I think that uh, even though there has been progress, as I mentioned before, in some of these uh, gender empowerment or gender equality and women empowerment action lines and strategies, uh, when we get into the practical issues, and now, as Lisa was mentioning, why women are not participating in workshops. Uh, so it's also exactly, it comes in different levels. You can have a, a very strong woman pushing for changes in, in a ministerial level, but I think that it has also to come down to other stakeholders involved in the different activities and from the, the bottom top as well. So it should be like a, a yeah, like a dual process coming a top bottom and bottom up. Um, and, and I also want also to recall on this also critical reading, and I think that uh, from the comments of Lisa and Gina, you could, you could also see sometimes we, we read information that things might be going well, but in the practice or in your day-to-day -day basis, uh, things are not showing that we're empowering women as much as we need to for them to make this substantive changes. So I think that leadership can come even from top level or from where your day-to-day -day basis is. Uh, and, and having these, um, I think that that also supporting the network of networks of women could also make a, a, a real difference in trying to organize yourselves and, and, and make more visible these initiatives. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm trying to build this change that I think that everyone could yeah, desire to have in our uh, future reality. Thank you. Uh, we have another one for Gina. I wish to know if the Ghanaian government is taking any initiative at the local level so as to respond to the negative impacts of COVID 
on the informal sector, especially for women performing these activities to feed their families, send, send their children to school, etc. If not, is there any initiative at the international level to help address these challenges in the long time period? Sorry, I forgot to mention it was asked by Ngomsi Monique. Uh, thanks for this question as well. So yes, something is being done in the Ghanaian context for the women, not only women even, but all workers in the informal sector because of how devastating COVID has had on them. And all, most of the people in the private sector, for example, teachers in private schools have been home since the closure and the schools are not making money to enable them pay these teachers. And the hotel, in the hospitality industry, those waiters, waitresses, those in the, at the low level, they've all been impacted. And also hairdressers, small scale entrepreneurs have seriously been impacted, both males and females, barbers, hairdressers, because people are scared to go and then have their hair done around this time. You don't know what you are going to pick from the salon. So the government has instituted some fund. And then there is the National Board for Small Scale Industry and then a committee overseeing the distribution of this fund as a form of capital to equip. And then it's, it's, you wouldn't say it's the biggest, but it's something to equip them in this crisis moment. So something is being done in the country. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Um, last question, uh, just gonna put out together actually a comment from Professor Salma and a question from Gonzalo Rodriguez. Um, the, the Professor Salma is actually saying the stereotype, stereotypical breakdown is fundamental in gender empowerment, which I think it's, it's important, it's really important. And I think this links to the other question, which is, I have a question, which is for all, for all panelists. How do you think it could be possible to involve men in promoting uh, the empowerment of women? as a strategy to move towards gender equality, example as it is done in as a sector. So actually involving men rather than just blaming them, but actually trying to tell them. And so breaking the stereotype of men being just the bad guys, but actually trying to see and take the best out of them. Because after all, we have to build it all together, not a lot. Okay, so can so, I start and add then others? Um, yes. Um, for example, when I was being introduced, they mentioned that I'm at a center within the university, which is a gender center. Continuously, we've realized that male involvement has become so key in gender cycles if we really want to achieve. Because putting women aside, empowering them, teaching them, educating them, and leaving the other side out, they don't know what you've told this um, side. So then, like creating the problems, then you single out. So we, we've realized that we need them as key agents to enable us drive and then achieve gender equality. And interestingly, when men speak, whether it's based on their traditional leadership role, patriarchal concepts, but when women are speaking on gender issues or feminine issues, they tend to listen better in a way than when women are speaking for women, people block out. Whenever we are having gender programs in the university, it's never easy. The attendance, the apathy towards gender issues is huge. But if we are able to get men involved, and gender sensitive men do, not all men, but then gradually we have gender sensitive men as agents, and change agents and then gradually we get to the others, I think we can make more impact. So it's a key thing that we've started looking at in gender cycles. Thanks. Maria Malia? Yeah, just to compliment, and I think that Gina's reply uh, yeah, included a lot of the, the, the items and very important uh, things to, to mention on how you can, I think that you get the perception that gender equality it's only women, but at the end, gender involves men and women. So I think that the ultimate goal is to have like this playing field where everyone has the same opportunities. As you were saying, Julia, it's not blaming someone of something. It's just really making up the opportunities for women and men to approach them and have these equal instruments and mechanisms just to to also be representative in decision makings in a, the coordination of some projects so so yeah maybe we have like these 
idea that gender equality is pushing just for more for women, but at the end of the day is how we make this a broad a, and plain terrain for, for everyone just to access resources and opportunities. And, and as Gina was saying, how we work together and we can accomplish a, many, many different things. So yeah, that would be my, my only addition to what Gina mentioned before. Yeah, hi everyone. I think for me, I agree with Maria, Malia and Gina. It's all about partnership. So yes, we need men and we need those strategies that we could work together for that um, ultimate outcome we want. Thank you. So with these last lines, given the time, I'm sorry, but we have reached our closing. Uh, I hope you've learned from the sessions. I actually enjoyed it a lot and I learned so much from the, so many different perspectives and important issues that are related to gender and diversity in ocean affairs. Um, I would just like to remind all participants that we will send a short feedback survey via email after the event. So if you could take a few minutes to respond, that would be great. So thank you to all the panelists. It was really great to have you. And thanks for, to all participants for staying with us and for your comments and questions. Have a good day, evening and night to you all. And uh, we'll hopefully see you soon again. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.